Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. April 21st, Year of Our Lord 2024. Your date for 2124. And many of you are starting to receive or already have received this booklet right here. Today you will be with me in paradise. Actually, it's titled Today You Will Be in Paradise. I try to use a little play on words there with that. And um, like I said, we got a deal and a discount because it didn't come out 100% how I wanted it to. The cover is a little bit off on how I want it. I wanted the picture a little smaller and the words bigger, the title. And the first page was a little bit offset, not crazy, just some of the sentences. But other than that, the booklet's exactly how I wanted and very happy because of that. We got a great discount. Um, so we were able to pinch some pennies and I try to pinch pennies all the time, folks. I'm always trying to find ways to be creative with the funds I get and to stay tight within a budget and not, uh, blow anybody's, uh, donations. I don't do that here. In fact, I tell people occasionally, and I remind people that if you've ever sent in a donation recently, obviously I can't go back six months or a year, but recently, and you're struggling with some type of uh, bill or something's going on in your life and you need to get that money back, all you gotta do is send me an email explain who you are and what you sent in. I will track it, trace it, and I will make sure I send you a check back or whatever. We don't play games here in this ministry with people's uh, finances. I am not a 5013C uh, government approved ministry. I run it like an LLC, therefore I run it like a small business I pay taxes and everything else like uh, the regular working Joes out there. So um, I try to keep it tight and I try to run a tight little budget. We are a small ministry, but I think we're a powerful one. Um, I have about 40 names on my mailing list somewhere in that neighborhood between family, friends and congregation, probably over 40. So I've sent out bundles of 10 to a, most people. So there's like 400 of these booklets out there right now. So if you've got a bundle of these, and you've got 10 of these, I would say pick and choose the times in your life you want to give them to people. But I would tell you, if you read this and get this under your belt, it's only about 16, 17 pages. The whole booklet itself from cover to cover is 18 pages. If you understand this and digest it, this can be a template for you to evangelize to people. It's very basic. It gives great scriptures. It great, gives great analogies, conversational analogies you can use with people when you evangelize. And it brings up the thief on the cross, which I believe, and I think most pastors that understand the grace of God believe. That story was put in there to put to rest any of the nonsense about working for your salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn and deserve the grace of God. Even after salvation, what he gives you is grace. It's all what he gives from his power, his source, his word, and the spirit, obviously. So having said that, these booklets, I think, are great. You guys should be receiving them. The last batch went out a few days ago. I think the last batch was about 20 or 18 booklets. I mean, 18, um, there's like 10 in an envelope, but like 18 people on my mailing list, the last 18 or whatever, I sent them out. So they're out there, and um, take advantage of them. Read them, understand them, hand them out at the right time to the right people. Let the Spirit lead you, and we will move forward. Those booklets will be at the conference with some of my other books. We'll set up a table at the Bible Conference in August in Denver, and that information is coming up as well. It's going to be on my PRB ministry website that Rob is working hard on to open that website up more and more. Um, finally, I have somebody working with me like that that I can trust and count on, that is opening up that website, and I'm able to take advantage of what I pay for, for that website, prbministry.org. So, if you're looking for um, different lessons, or notes, or different things like that, or ways to contact me, go to prbministry.org. That's what the website's for. So, having said that, I feel very blessed about Rob. We want to keep Rob and Marla in prayer out there in Texas. And uh, I don't have a lot of other announcements except the reminder, next Sunday I am off. I'm taking a mental health weekend, <laughs> just like everybody else out there. I have to take a sick day once in a while. So uh, I told you guys before that uh, the wife and I are going to do a weekend getaway Jeep thing. It's almost like bike week in Daytona, but it's Jeep week in Daytona right now. 
So we want to go to the final weekend ceremonies there at Jeep Week in Daytona. So we will be there next weekend. Thursday's class will be my last class until the following Tuesday. No Sunday class next week. Um, so just having said that, we will start again with the Lord's Supper the following week or whatever. So I need to take the break and I am going to do so. And I appreciate you guys giving me a break. Probably the only other break I'll take after that will be the wedding I have to do up in New England the week of 4th of July, which normally I take a few days off around 4th of July anyway. So, uh, I'll get back to you on that, but next Sunday, no class. I think that's all we got. Let's jump into it. Our title today, Blinded to the Gospel, The Trickery of Satan is Real. Amen? Blinded to the Gospel, The Trickery of Satan is Real. That's your title. You are in lesson number 74, 2 Thessalonians, message or lesson number 74. And again, your date, 421-24 is your date. If you're ever looking for messages, if you're new, and I have a few new people popping in and off, if you're new... I'm on Rumble, Brighteon, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, occasionally, I put some videos up on Truth Social as well. I have an account there. All my notes can be found on PRB Ministry Facebook page, my raw notes. You can find all this information at prbministry.org, bottom of the slide. But how I track and trace my messages, if you ask me for one, is by the number, today's lesson, number 74, 2 Thessalonians, lesson 74, the date and the title. So I have to have two of those three items to track a message you're looking for. The date, the title, and the number. That's what they're there for. Having said that, that's it. Let's jump into it. Let's do the most important thing we do. Get filled with the Spirit. Get into the Word. Two power options. Because in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for that pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow in respect to your salvation. In order to grow up, you have to take in the Word of God, folks, habitually, and be filled with that new nature, that Christ-like nature. It's called the filling power of the Spirit. When you're filled and that new nature is taking over, you're walking or moving forward, even if it's only for a few minutes before you fall and sin again, but you're walking or moving forward in a Christ-like new nature given to you at salvation. That's the one you want to work on. That's the one you want to focus on. That's why you keep short accounts with your old nature. When you fail and fumble and sin, name and cite it, wash yourself clean and move on. Keep short accounts with your old nature. 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. The Apostle John tells us what? Believers, if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, plain and simple, believers, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 10. The Apostle John writes, Believers, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. Take a moment of silent prayer. Name and sight any known sins first and foremost. Get rid of the distractions and we will keep this lost and dying world and each other and the Bible conference and so many things in prayer. Obviously, Israel as well we've been praying for recently. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, we're going to lift up Israel and those innocent folks between Gaza and Israel and that whole section in the Middle East there. We're going to pray for those innocents that are stuck between those perpetuating war across this world. Because we know many of our leaders across the world are not who they claim to be. And they are not following your word, Father. And therefore, they promote violence and war and the pushing each other and attacking each other and lying and manipulating. And so many counterfeits and lies are out there, Father. But we are praying for the land of Israel and the people of Israel. We're also praying for the innocent folks on the other side that are subject to this violence, Father. 
We keep Russia, we keep Ukraine in prayer as well. We don't have all the exact details, Father, but we want to pray for the innocent people stuck in war. And Father, we're praying for your word to shine a light on those leaders and your word to come forth in their life and their life so they can go forward and lead by the truth of the scriptures, the mind of Christ. And Father, we're praying for this lost and dying world and we're keeping each other in prayer. We're continuing to lift up all the little, all the little situations we stumble across each and every day that cause us distractions and pray for each other going through financial burdens, medical burdens, personal burdens, attacks from the cosmic system. We know our unity gives us strength to go forward. Our unity in the word, our unity in the spirit, our unity as a royal family gives us strength to go forward. So we're praying for that unity and we're praying for one another and we'll keep that Bible conference the first weekend in August in prayer as well, Father. We're praying for all of these things, lifting each other up in prayer. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Usually there's a list of things I could go down and pray for, but you can get a little carried away at the beginning of the message. I want to pray for the message, but I want to keep you guys in prayer, and I want to keep those things out there in the world in prayer and remind you of different things to pray for in your personal life. You as prayer warriors need to gather with your circle of family and friends or even by yourself as a believer priest and pray for all these things as well. Pray for one another. Pray for this world. Pray for our leaders. The Bible conference, whatever it is that we pray for habitually before these classes, you should keep in your personal prayers throughout the week as well. So let's jump into it, folks. Blinded to the Gospel, the Trickery of Satan is Real is your title. Open back up in 2 Thessalonians where we've been. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's where our study has been. Anchored in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. In fact, pick it back up in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. 2 Thessalonians 2.7. The Apostle Paul goes on to write, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. It's been at work, folks, since the serpent in the garden. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is removed, speaking of the power of the ministry of God the Holy Spirit on this earth and those positive believers going forward. We, we operate with the ministry of God the Holy Spirit as a restraining shield. So that way Satan and his army do not have full authority yet. Yes, they do have a lot of power. But imagine full authority, which you will see in the seven years of tribulation. Meaning what? Verse 7, meaning at the rapture of the church, verse 7, rapture of the church, is a major shift in the ministry of God the Holy Spirit on earth. That will happen. That's what verse 7 points to, the rapture of the church. 2 Thessalonians 2.8. Then the lawless one will be revealed, beginning of the tribulation, whom the Lord will eliminate with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. The second coming of Christ at the end of the seven-year tribulation is the warrior king I just taught you about, who comes back and lays waste to the battle of Armageddon and all the enemies of the cross. And he deals with the situation, like I said, in very swift and violent fashion, and opens up the thousand-year millennial reign of his rule on earth for a thousand years. I showed you last lesson when Christ steps down at the second advent, he first appears as what? I always call him. Second advent is the warrior king. Then he takes care of business in a very violent and swift fashion, period. I showed you that. No questions. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.9. That is what? The one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan. We, we're going to look at this definition today, and actually the next couple lessons, verses 9 and 10, are very important. He's saying, what is he saying? The Apostle Paul saying, Then the lawless one will be revealed, beginning of the tribulation, whom the Lord at the end of the tribulation will eliminate with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is the one, Antichrist, whose coming is in accord, in conjunction, working for... The activity of Satan with all power, fault, signs, and wonders. Yes, satanic and demonic elements have signs and wonders. Be careful. A lot of churches do signs and wonders, and I will tell you they're not from the God we know, capital G. They're from the small God of this earth. 
As I mentioned last lesson, these two next scriptures, verse 9 and 10, are of extreme importance for the day and age we live in today, year of our Lord 2024. In fact, if you are new to the ministry, and I have some new folks popping on and off, because you know why? Rob's hard work behind the scenes doing those little reels and shorts that I've put out there have alerted people to this ministry. So in fact, if you're new to the ministry, I'd suggest go back about a month or longer, a month or longer to get caught up with lessons on the days of Noah and the teaching on Nimrod and the seeds of Satan. You have to go back a few weeks. I would say a month. If you're brand new and you're just stumbling onto this ministry in recent days or last few weeks, make sure you've gone back and caught up on the days of Noah and the teaching on Nimrod and the seeds of Satan. Very important. We'll be diving deep into some historical context shortly in the lessons ahead. It will all begin to fit together as a puzzle, and some of it, I believe, some of it, a lot of it, I think, will give you a wake-up as to what you thought you knew about certain people. Remember, I told you, year 2024 into 2025, I think, is the God, uh, it God is time to reveal things and maybe even get a reprieve of the chaos by 2025. But I, I tell you, it's only going to be very brief. But it will all begin to fit together as a puzzle if you've been with me. And some of it will give you a wake up as to what you thought you knew about certain people, what you thought you knew about respected organizations and historical facts that have been operating in levels of authority for centuries. Hundreds of years, thousands of years. Certainly here in America, several hundred years. This will all start to come together in a much clearer picture as we begin the next set of lessons or the next doctrinal series I'm getting into. 2 Thessalonians 2.10, let's look at that. And with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not. Simple fact. Here's your altar call. They did not accept the godly virtue love, impersonal, unconditional love of the truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ to be saved. That's what it means. Because the love they're talking about, godly virtue love, agape it's called, Agapao, the application of that love, agape, is impersonal, unconditional love. It cannot be achieved at the right level, at the highest level, unless you are in union with Christ, the truth, the word. Union with Christ, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That is the only way, folks. That is the only way to heaven. There is no other name under the heavens except for Jesus Christ. It is faith alone in Christ alone. And as that booklet will show you, if you're interested in it, I'll send it to you if you're new. I'll send you a, a dozen of them, of those booklets, and let me know you want them, and study that little booklet. Take you a few minutes, but go over it, and you will see. There is no works. There's no water rituals. There's no confessing sin to another sinner. There's none of that nonsense. You recognize you're a sinner. You need a Savior. That is it. It is Jesus Christ, singular. Faith alone in Christ alone. And I would say, welcome to the royal family if you made that one-shot decision. You see, verses 9 and 10 have a great deal of details as to where we are today, year of our Lord 2024, and where we are heading into the beast system just before the rapture. And I teach there's a lot of confusion and pinches of pain for the church leading up to the tribulation. Because the rapture will happen right before the tribulation. Does the rapture happen and the tribulation begin three days or six months later? I don't know. It's on God's timetable. But leading up to that time, the buildup of this beast system, there will be pain and confusion for the church. Let me tell you something. And I see it on the landscape already. 2 Thessalonians 2.11 For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false now. We're going to be looking at verse 11 probably in another month or so. And when we get into that, it's going to answer a lot of questions that people have. Why would God allow evil? Why does God make this one do that and make this one do this that's evil? God isn't making anybody do anything. He gives us free will. Never forget that. 2 Thessalonians 2.12 In order that 
they all may be judged who did not believe the truth, the word, the gospel, Jesus Christ, but took pleasure in wickedness. There is nothing more important than the word of God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with, was with us, the word was always with us, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Do not assume you can grow outside of the word of God, the mind of Christ. The word and Jesus Christ are one. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, royal family. Any church that's making an issue out of anything else but the word, the accuracy of the word, the mind of Christ, is a church that can lead you astray if you're not careful. My personal opinion, how's that? 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. <clears throat> While you guys go to 2 Corinthians 4, I want to show you something. Our focus will begin on what the Apostle Paul is stating right here at the beginning of verse 9. Let me put that on the board. What does it say? The one who is coming is in accord. Enter ergeo. Enter ergeo actually in the Greek, in accord with the activity of Satan, coming with supernatural power. That's what it would mean, where the rubber meets the road. Coming with supernatural power, working or effective power, only used, pay attention to me, this word you're looking at, it doesn't say accord, it says energia in the Greek, only used in the New Testament for the power of God or satanic power, either or. There is no middle ground. How many times have you heard me say that? There is no middle ground. There's not your little campsite in the middle of God's campsite and Satan's campsite. There's two. There's two. You're either a believer or an unbeliever. It's either God or Satan. And this word here defines the two. Only used in the New Testament for the power of God or satanic power, period. And ergeia. This is where we get our word, English word, energy from. If you even look at how it's spelled, but how it sounds out. Energia. Energy. It's where we get our word energy from in the English. But this one is supernatural. It comes from a Greek root word meaning effective power, something with great presence or ability or great force. Almost unexplainable. Supernatural. This word is only used in the New Testament to point to the power God has, divine power under the hand of God or satanic power from demonic influence. Very specific. Tells you right there when you study the original language a little bit, you start tearing these things apart and take your time in the accuracy of the word. You start learning there is no middle ground. That word right there, how that's written, 2 Thessalonians 2.9, the one who's coming is in accordance with the energia. Supernatural energy with the activity of Satan. That word, that statement right there tells you two camps, God or Satan's. This word is only used, folks, in the New Testament. You can look it up. You'll see it used about seven times, I think, or eight times in the New Testament. This word is only used in the New Testament to point to the power under God's divine hand or satanic power from the demonic influence, either or. So if you think you're on your own out there and you're not going to be a believer and you're not going to be an unbeliever, you're not going to deal with this God and Satan thing, you're lying. You're telling yourself lies. You're looking in the mirror and lying to yourself. And I think deep down inside, because God gave us this little hole in our soul that can only be filled by the cross of Jesus Christ, that you know when you look in the mirror. You know. You need the one true God. You have to come to believe upon Christ. You see, Satan has the ability to empower this Antichrist. Satan has the ability to empower any Antichrist. Like I told you before, Jesus and the apostles often mention Antichrists in the plural. Many will come performing signs and wonders. Angels of light even behind pulpits. Satan has the ability to empower this Antichrist. Remember, the Antichrist is only one of a few men in history, human history, to be possessed by Satan himself. Only one of a few to be possessed by Satan himself. Satan's not going to possess somebody that's just a local yokel that has nothing to do with the plan of God. He's going to possess certain people at very 
important historical pivotal points, Judas Iscariot being one of them, right next to Jesus Christ. A lot of people don't realize Peter, John, and Judas at one point were the closest ones to our Lord as far as having communication and intimate time with him. Very interesting that he took one of the three closest men to our Lord to become possessed Remember, the Antichrist is only one of a few men in human history to be possessed by Satan himself. I believe, my free speech, my First Amendment right, I believe the Antichrist will be a seed of Satan. And if you haven't been with me the last couple months, you might not understand what that is. And I'm going to elaborate on it in the months to come as well. I believe the Antichrist will be a seed of Satan, which would mean an offspring of of some form or fashion in the line of Nimrod and Cain. That's what it would mean. That it would trace all the way back. That's what I believe he's going to be from. Now that may sound bizarre, and that's fine. That may sound bizarre to some folks, but in the future lessons, you will see how some families have kept bloodlines or family ties alive for thousands of years making sure there's a blood tie throughout the family that goes back generations upon generations upon generations. I tell you today, as I've mentioned many times in the past, there are true Luciferian circles of power across the globe. It's a fact. Some families that have great authority influencing governments and world banking systems that have purposefully and this has gone on throughout history. They've set themselves alongside kings and queens or became kings and queens themselves. So I'm telling you as of today, I've mentioned it many times in the past, there are true Luciferian circles of power across the globe. Some families that have great authority influencing governments and world banking systems that have purposefully kept the bloodline that may trace backward in history for thousands of years. At least that's what they believe, and there's strong, I think, strong evidence out there that may link that. Many of these families have successfully hidden behind Judaism and Christianity and are highly respected world leaders or wealthy influencers. You see them all the time. You've read about them in your history books. Many of these families have successfully hidden behind Judaism and Christianity and are highly respected world leaders or wealthy influencers. They are counterfeits of the highest degree. Again, if you haven't been with me, you wouldn't know what I'm talking about. Go back and learn. Satan and his army have several pillars of power and trickery that they rely upon since the original garden. We've looked at that recently. Some of the weaponry Satan uses. So Satan and his army, remember a third of the angels... A third of the angels came with Satan. Satan and his army have several pillars of power and trickery that they rely upon since the original garden. The art of deception. They are kings at this, masters. The art of deception, counterfeiting and usurping power by inverting God's plan and God's word is what they are masters at. Inverting, twisting something inside out. Taking something that looks true, that may be true, inverting it and using it for something wicked. Satan and his army have several pillars of power and trickery that they rely upon since the original garden. The art of deception, counterfeiting, and usurping power by inverting God's plan and God's word is what they are masters at. Please never forget that. The four divine establishments, and you're taught well if you're with this ministry... And my lineage, you should understand the four divine establishments. They're key targets. They are key targets for Satan. The four of them, I go over them every once in a while. There should be no question. Your freedom, originally given in the garden, free will. God gave you freedom, freedom of thought, free will. Christian marriage, real man, real woman. Christian family, Christian family values. Raising a family under the principles of God. And number four is nationalism. Yes, you heard me, nationalism. When operating at a high level, these four 
if they're operating at a high level under the under the power of the word of God, these are impenetrable to a demonic one world order. They are impenetrable. They're like a tank that you can't shoot. No matter how many missiles and things you shoot at this supernatural tank, you can't break through it. Impenetrable. These four, when they're operating right, right thing done in the right way at a high level, are impenetrable to a demonic one world order, which is what Satan needs to sit on top of. He can only be at one place at one time. So when you look at why things are under attack, does it not make sense? Why we see what we see? What's happened to Christian marriage? What's happened to real man and real woman? What's happened to nationalism? What's happened to the values and family raising them godly? What's been under attack? Think about these things, folks. Once you understand this as some of the main targets, you can see the enemy very clearly. You can see it in the movies you watch. You can see it in commercials. You can see it in leaders across the world. You can see it in ideologies. You can see it in the educational systems. That which God creates for good, Satan desires to distort and destroy. And he likes to do it in a very subtle, trickery fashion, like an inverting. So you don't even realize you're doing it like he did in the garden with the woman. That which God creates for good, Satan desires to distort or destroy. During the next series of lessons, we will take a deeper look into some of the arsenal and applications of those weapons that Satan and his army use. I'm going to put something on the board written by Professor Lewis Ferry Schaefer, who is my great-great-grandfather, I guess, spiritual great-great-grandfather. Satanic darkness, an extraordinary disclosure is made in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, where we're going, of the fact that unregenerated men, unbelievers, individual Jew and Gentile alike, doesn't matter who you are, are blinded as to the gospel and that this blindness is a veil upon their mind. This incapacity to respond to the gospel has been imposed by Satan with a view to impending the normal reception of the message concerning God's saving grace. Professor Lewis Berry Schaefer, Systematic Theology. Right there. Great book, great set of books to have if you don't, you don't have them and you want to go deeper into what I believe is accurate theology, systematic theology, Professor Lewis Berry Schaefer, right there on the board. Satanic darkness, an extraordinary disclosure is made in 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4, of the fact that unregenerated men, individual Jew and Gentile, are alike, are blinded as to the gospel, and that this blindness is a veil upon their mind. This incapacity to respond to the gospel has been imposed by Satan with a view to impending the normal reception of the message concerning God's saving grace. Again, Lewis Berry Schaefer, that's taken from his famous writings of Systematic Theology, Volume 1, Chapter 6. Volume 1, Chapter 6. I'll leave it up there for you to ponder a little bit and put in your notes. First and foremost, without faith alone in Christ alone, you are living a life separated from God, period. There's no argument. Even that last scripture I showed you in 2 Thessalonians, looking at the word we now know as energy in the original Greek and how Paul is using it, there's only two camps. So first and foremost, without faith alone in Christ alone, you're living a life separated from God, not just now, <laughs> but in eternity. You know why hell is called, the lake of fire is called everlasting? Because there's a, a definitive beginning and no ending. You know why God's called eternal? Because there's no beginning and no ending. So I'm telling you, you're heading to an everlasting misery if you do not believe upon Jesus Christ. Plain and simple. I don't care what you did. I don't care if you're listening to this message and you were a murderer and you're sitting in jail waiting to be executed because that's the law of the land. And you know what? You have to respect the law of the land. You can believe upon Jesus Christ. You can repent and turn to the one like the thief on the cross did, realizing I'm a sinner. I failed. I need a savior. He is it. And you're saved. The first line of assault for Satan and his army 
is always to keep the lost and dying world blind to the truth of Jesus Christ. That's one of his first lines of attack. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where you guys should be at, we have a continuation of what the Apostle Paul was teaching in chapter 3. I'm going to put uh, 2 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15 on the board. You don't have to go there, but if you want to flip back and look at the end of uh, chapter 3, it's very imperative into chapter 4 because it's all one same lesson. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we have a continuation of what the Apostle Paul was teaching in chapter 3. It becomes important to understand all this because it do does go together. 2 Corinthians 3.14. Let me grab a drink. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 3.14 and 15 on the board. The Apostle Paul is talking, looking backward at the dispensation of Israel. What does he say to the church at Corinth? But their minds were hardened. What, what did Lewis Barry Safer say? Their minds were hardened. 2 Corinthians 3.14. For until this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the truth of Scripture, Mosaic Law, the same veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. They never understood their Messiah. Verse 15, in fact, uh, Orthodox Jew Judaism is still waiting for the Messiah. They don't believe Jesus Christ. They believe he was a prophet. That's it. Just like the Muslims do. And actually, they consider him a false prophet. Many of them do. 2 Corinthians 3, 14, But their minds were hardened, for until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. Verse 15, But to this day, to this day, and I say the year of our Lord, 2024, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. And in fact, they even added to it like religion does. I told you about the Talmud. I keep you reminding you of these things. The Apostle Paul, who was an expert in the Torah and also understood the writings of the Talmud, because by the time the age of the apostles came and Christ was on earth, Doctrine of the Hypostatic Union, his earthly ministry, the Talmud was being put in written form. Because he was a Pharisee, Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, in his prior life, and was clear, clearing, clearly saying here, Judaism was blinding them. Judaism was blinding them. They didn't even understand their scriptures. All the professors and Sadducees and scribes and Pharisees, the wealthy men of the Sanhedrin that was so well-schooled, were well-schooled in the wrong aspects of their own scriptures, and they had added into it as well. What God had given to his people became distorted. Sound familiar? What God had given to his people became distorted. The people of God were infiltrated. I told you that. The original teaching was twisted, and that was what Paul was saying. More or less, where the rubber meets the road. What was he saying? What God had given his people became distorted. Not God's fault. The people of God were infiltrated. The original teaching was twisted. That was what Paul was saying. And I tell you, today there's a lot of this nonsense. They were blinded because religion. Religion is man-made which means Satan had his hand in it. They were blinded because religion, which is the trump card of Satan, had successfully counterfeited the original teaching of Moses, completely inverted and twisted it. Then over the years, certainly during the Babylonian captivity, I told you they came out with all the different um, add-ons and additions. And prior to that, they were following a lot of false gods and idols. They kept falling on their face like we all do. So they were blinded because of religion, which is the trump card of Satan and had successfully counterfeited the original teaching of Moses. Not only that, but as I told you weeks and weeks ago, after Babylonian captivity, there was a deeper infiltration into the nation of Israel. And again, as the weeks and months go on, I'll show you these things. I've been opening it up for you. This goes back to the failure of the nation of Israel in eradicating the promised land of seeds of Satan. Didn't I show you that? This goes back to the failure of the nation of Israel in eradicating the promised land of the seeds of Satan. Now, people would say different things like, well, you called Jesus Christ the warrior king, and you studied uh, and it showed us that 
God told uh, uh, Joshua and Moses and, and those folks that were coming out of the Exodus generation to completely eradicate, wipe out violently their enemies. He did. It's in Scripture. You're taking it personal. You're emotional. Oh, well, am I your enemy for telling you the truth? This goes back to the failure of the nation of Israel in eradicating the promised land of the seeds of Satan. Remember, I told you about Nimrod and giants in the land after the flood. All of these things you should be coming familiar with. So when God tells you to wipe something out, wipe it out. Amen? 2 Corinthians 3.16 But whenever someone turns to the Lord, there it is. 2 Corinthians 3.16 But whenever someone turns, metanoia in the Greek turns means a form of repenting. I changed my mind. I'm going the wrong way. Turns to the Lord Jesus Christ. The veil is taken away. That satanic veil can only be removed when we come to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you, even after salvation, you can walk down the wrong, wrong road if you're not serious with the intake of the word. The good news is, once saved, always saved. It's called eternal security. But that satanic veil can only be removed when we come to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, which points to a moment of humility and our God-given free will turning to the only Savior. It takes a moment of humility. That's why there's a lot of people that say, yeah, I know about God, I believed on Jesus Christ. Did you really? Because the real way to believe upon Jesus Christ has to do with a clinging to him. In that moment of salvation, you realize I'm a sinner. I can't, do, I can't do this. Help, I need a savior. He's it. That's true faith alone in Christ alone. Not just, yeah, I know about that Jesus guy. Yeah, I believed in Jesus one time before. Did you, did you really? Which points to a moment of humility and our God-given free will turning to the only savior. There is no greater example than that thief on the cross. He's moments away from dying. And you know, it's funny because I think it was Deacon Jimmy and I were talking on the phone the other day. And he said that that thief on the cross could have been just like the other thief. And it looks like he might have been hurling insults at our Lord for hours. Until all of a sudden he realized before he died, this is the unique God-man, Jesus Christ. This is the Messiah. I know I belong here on this cross. I want to be with him. I believe on him. He'll save me. And that's what that thief did. And he might have, 20 minutes prior to be, being born again and saved, been hurling insults with the other thief on the cross at our Lord. We simply don't know. The Apostle Paul begins chapter 4, where you guys are at, with a word of reassurance. Because he's addressing a congregation of believers even though they were stubborn and stiff-necked, 2 Corinthians. Church at Corinth was one of the more difficult, and it's funny because they were a highly educated and fairly wealthy group. One of the most stingiest and stubbornest groups was the church at Corinth. <laughs> and they, they had the most comfort, wealth, and money, and, and, and education. And they were the most difficult one, one of, the, one of his most difficult congregations. 2 Corinthians 4, one. Therefore, since we have this ministry... As we receive mercy, we do not lose heart. Now, you, you realize chapter 3 goes into chapter 4. You know what he's talking about. The Apostle Paul is stating, as believers, we have a ministry of Christ. Remember, mercy is for yesterday's failures. Grace is to live in today. Mercy is for yesterday's failures. Grace is for today. The Apostle Paul is stating, as believers, we have a ministry of Christ working within us because of that mercy. They accepted the grace gift just as you and I did, I hope. We have eternal security, one and done. Once the veil is lifted, we can embrace truth, and we need to seek truth away from religion and lies. That gets a lot of believers in trouble, though they're born again and saved. Once the veil is lifted, we can embrace truth. We need to seek truth away from religion and lies. That's why you better vet the spirit that's coming from the pulpit, whether it's me or anybody else. 2 Corinthians 4.2. Look at 2 Corinthians 4.2 on the board. The Apostle Paul goes on to tell them, 
But we've renounced, renounced, spoke against now the things hidden because of shame, not walking in trickery or distorting the word of God after salvation. But by the open proclamation of truth, commending ourselves to every person's conscience in the sight of God. In other words, what we're doing, we can lay right out in front of God. We know we're walking in the, in the truth of the word of God. We know we accepted Christ, the gospel. We know we're walking the right way. We can lay it down in front of people and God comfortably, not arrogantly. We just lay it out. Satan had been successful in distorting the truth. He always is. Also infiltrating the people of God in the dispensation of Israel because they were led astray by deceptive schemes constantly. Think about that. Like I said, in chapter 3, he's covering the nation of Israel and their failures. Satan had been successful in distorting the truth, also infiltrating the people of God in the dispensation of Israel. Remember the tares and the wheat? I, rem I remind you of that parable. That parable has been going on since the garden, after the garden. Tares among the wheats. The wheat is the good, pure wheat, the believers, but there are those that look like they may be believers side by side, choking out the truth. Satan had been successful in distorting the truth, also infiltrating the people of God in the dispensation of Israel because they were led astray by the deceptive schemes of Satan, the trickery. Most of their problems arose from a lack of respect for upholding the word of God. Sound familiar? Most of their problems arose from a lack of respect for upholding the word of God. It's not any different today, royal family. Show me a divorced couple. I'll show you a problem with upholding the word of God. Show me a criminal. I'll show you a problem with upholding the word of God. Show me a person in addiction. I'll show you a problem with upholding the word of God. The problem always traces backward. You got to peel the onion back a few layers, like I tell you. But the problem always traces backward into family and choices we make that are ungodly. It always traces back to the family unit, how somebody was raised, and then the choices that person made as they became responsible for their life. You can always trace things back. So let me say this again, and this may get, may get some people's back against the wall. But I'm telling you, it's no different today. So don't look at the Exodus generation and say, I would have never done any of that. And I would have done exactly what God told me to do. I would have never fell for the Jezebel spirit when, when uh, uh, Ahaz was in, when, when uh, the northern tribe of Israel fell for that. Oh, I would have never went in false idols and false gods. I would have never done this. I would have never, I would have never fell for all the Babylonian uh, uh, blood, sex, money, magic during that time of captivity. Don't tell yourself that. It's no different today. Show me a divorced couple. I'll show you a problem with upholding the word of God. Show me a criminal. I'll show you a problem with upholding the word of God. Show me a person in addiction. I'll show you a problem with upholding the word of God. And I speak from experience in all this. We've all fell right on our face. Amen. The problem always traces backward into family and then choices, free will, we make that are ungodly, one after another. Most of the time, it traces back many, many years, but nonetheless, it's an issue of not upholding the word of God, period. From very early on, God's people were distracted and enticed by false gods and idols that Satan had placed all around them because they were called to wipe them off the land after the flood. The Exodus generation was called to wipe them away. The blinding happens to the unbelievers, so they are following the lies of the cosmic system instead of the truth of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. While the born-again believers can be distracted after salvation by religious counterfeits or even human viewpoint. Let me say that again. The blinding happens to the unbeliever so they're following the lies of the cosmic system, and many think they're doing their own thing. I'm my own person. Just like Satan said in heaven, hey guys, you want to follow me? You can be your own angel. You don't have to follow this godly thing. Follow me. 
and swept away a third of the angels, being their own little gods. The blinding happens to the unbelievers, so they're following the lies in the cosmic system instead of the truth of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, while the born-again believer can be distracted after salvation by religious counterfeits or even human viewpoint. Usually it's emotional nonsense. Satan is the master counterfeiter. Satan is the master counterfeiter, and his schemes have always been cloaked by pieces of truth. Cloaked by pieces of truth. That's why he's so successful at blinding the world. It started in the garden. He just took one or two words, and he twisted them, and the man and the woman in the garden followed along. Now, the Amplified Bible puts it like this, which touches closer to the original language of what the Apostle Paul's lesson was saying. I'm going to put the Amplified version of 2 Corinthians 4, 2. It's, the Amplified's very wordy, but a lot of times it defines some of what the original language says. And in this case, I really like it. 2 Corinthians 2, 4, this is the Amplified version. <clears throat> we have renounced disgraceful ways, secret thoughts, feelings, desires, and underhandedness, trickery, methods and arts that men hide through shame. We refuse to deal craftily, to practice trickery and cunning, or to adulterate or handle dishonestly the word of God, but we state the truth openly, clearly, and candidly, and so we commend ourselves in the sight and presence of God to every man's conscience because we know we're following it accurately. We've sought out God truthfully in the new nature with an open heart. 2 Corinthians 4 2, amplified. I'll read it again, and I'll leave it up there. We've renounced disgraceful ways, secret thoughts, feelings, desires, and underhandedness. Methods and arts that men hide through shame, we refuse to deal craftily, to practice trickery and cunning, or to adulterate or to handle dishonestly the word of God, but we state the truth openly, clearly, and candidly, and so we commend ourselves in the sight and presence of God to every man's conscience. That's a nice way of looking at that verse right there. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. The Apostle Paul is clearly telling those believers at Corinth, as well as today, royal family, that the purity of the Mosaic law and what God intended had been hijacked by religious deception. How's that where the rubber meets the road? Pastor Rick. The Apostle Paul is clearly telling those believers at Corinth, as well as today, that the purity of the Mosaic law, the reason and lessons behind it and what God intended had been hijacked by religious deception. So much so that when the true Messiah arrived, the Jewish leadership either refused to recognize him, arrogance, or were so lost in the counterfeit system that they were blinded by it. You ever think about that? So much so that when the true Messiah arrived, the Jewish leadership and most of the people as well, either refused to recognize him out of arrogance or were so lost in their counterfeit system that they were blinded by it. Which again, falls on them because once you reach an age of accountability, God holds you responsible. Satan will always be working, folks, to distract, distort, and destroy what God creates. Satan will always be working to distract, distort, and destroy what God creates. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. Not walking in trickery, it says, nor distorting the word of God. What are those two words there? Poinogia. And the other word is delao. Poinogia and delao. Poinogia points to what? That walking in trickery. And walking, we know, in the present tense means lifestyle. Poinogia. Walking in trickery, nor distorting the word of God, carrying on deceitful affairs, is one definition. Trickery and craftiness at a high level is another. Carrying on deceitful affairs, 
trickery and craftiness at a high level, similar to how magicians fool you in plain sight. You know, we went to dinner with my son and his wife last night. A great Italian restaurant. We finally found one. <laughs> it's about an hour away near my son's house. But we were talking about um, the magician, uh, David Copperfield in Las Vegas, and that's how unbelievable his show is. He does it right in front of you, the trickery. That's what it means. If you've ever been to one of his shows, you know what I'm talking about. Similar to how a magician fools you in plain sight. Walking in a manner that presents a false gospel, a counterfeit. That word should be familiar in your vocabulary if you've been with me the last few years. Walking in a manner that presents a false gospel, counterfeit. Poinogia, it comes from a root word meaning not only crafty, but very clever. Again, Satan may be arrogant, but he is not stupid. He's a genius. There's a depth of intelligence suggested within that description. A very deep depth of intelligence suggested within that description. The original language uses the term delotho one time here in the New Testament. One time and one time only. Distorting. Delotho. In reference to the distortion or adultery of the word of God. A false or counterfeit of the truth. The lot, though, one time here used in the New Testament, how it's used. In reference to the distortion or adultery of the word of God. A false or counterfeit of the truth. 2 Corinthians 4, 3. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Right there, veiled. And if, 2 Corinthians 4, 3, if our gospel is in the Greek first class condition, meaning yes, it is true. Satan has ways to distract and distort the gospel, which in a sense is blinding unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in whose case the God, small g, of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Jesus Christ is God. Doctrine of the hypostatic union. All of the apostles taught from a place of recognizing the angelic conflict. Did you know that? Why don't you? All of the apostles taught from a place of recognizing the angelic conflict and Satan's worldly throne as a matter of fact, not speculation. God of this world. John, Peter, Paul, they reference, if you look at some of the leaders in the early church, they reference the angelic conflict and the power and authority of Satan. Why don't you pay attention to it? I didn't say be afraid of it. Pay attention to it. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves your bondservants on account of Jesus. We're willing slaves under Jesus. You're either a willing slave under the cosmic system, or you're a willing slave under our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and you become part of his family. He loves you. When we spread truth, we do so from our union with Christ, the new nature, not from emotions and worldly viewpoint. Truth is singular. It is taught or spread in that fashion, singular truth. There's not five ways to heaven. Singular. That's the big argument. That's the big issue with the beast system being built around you. They talk about a God or the God or whatever. Talk about Jesus Christ. See what happens. Singular truth. The way, the truth, and the light is only through Christ. No distortion, no trickery, or hidden agendas. Folks, the one world religious system, we're getting ready to wrap it up. The one world religious system is actively being put together around you. It may be the one part of the beast system that church age believers feel the sting of confusion, grief, and assaults from the most before the rapture. Let me say that again, and I think I've been clarifying this in the last few months. The one world religious system is actively being put together. It may be the one part of the beast system that church age believers feel the sting of confusion, grief, and assaults from the most before the rapture. Folks, the Federal Reserve, 
the International Monetary Fund, IMF, World Banking Systems, through the United Nations, has long since been structured for global dominance. That's your one world banking. That's long since been structured. All the pieces are in place. I would tell you soft socialism in America since the 1970s has weakened the only free country, the only client nation unto God left, standing in the way of a one world governing body. So I'm telling you the structures for the one world banking and the one world government, they're already all around us. You have to be a fool not to see them. So what has to be built as well and secured right at the beginning of that seven year tribulation, the one world religious system. The rest, I'm telling you, the rest of the apparatus for a one world government, one world banking is all around you. Listen, we have an unconstitutional Federal Reserve that was brought to us almost in the middle of the night. People were voting. They didn't want anything to do with it. But yet certain families, seeds and agents of Satan, brought it in. They made sure there was a crash. And then by 1913, we had a Federal Reserve that's not federal and it's not a reserve. It's run by a handful of families across the world. We are one major war or one large Green New Deal away from merging under the umbrella of the nation. One world nation. We are one major war or one large Green New Deal away from merging under the umbrella of the United Nations or one globalist movement. In fact, the United Nations, their organizations like the WHO, World Health Organization, who dictated all the virus nonsense. The WHO through the United Nations. Their organizations like the WHO, the World Health Organization, the WEF, the World Economic Forum, the European Union, the World Banking Systems, the Bilderberg Groups we know about, just to name a few, already hold incredible power over American politics and American policy. The Antichrist could be alive and in front of us today, absolutely. All the chess pieces, what I'm telling you, are in order. Yet he will not be revealed, nobody's going to be able to pick him out, he will not be revealed until the beginning of the seven years of tribulation. The one world banking and one world government are almost fully assembled. The one world banking and one world government are almost fully assembled. It's the one world religious system. The Babylonian mother of prostitutes who rides the beast, Revelation chapter 17, if you've been with me, that is not yet fully assembled. That religious system of the beast needs greater attention for the completion. That religious system of the beast needs greater attention for its completion. The blinding of the unbelievers will increase as we approach the tribulation. And the dwindling of really good teaching will happen as you approach the tribulation as well. So too will the confusion and counterfeits of true Christianity. And just to give you a little food for thought, when I bring up things like the United Nations, did you know, I, did, I put a little side note, that their original publication department was called the Lucifer Publishing Company. That's a fact. They changed it. Now they have something called the Lucius Trust, which is all their documents and funding. United Nations, NATO, European nations, they're all very Luciferian symbolics. And symbolism. I'm not making it up. You do your own research. But again, if you go on the first page of Google, which is run by these nuts, you'll get all kinds of interesting articles about, well, they called it this, they called that, people got offended, so we changed it from the Luciferian publishing and Luciferian whatever it was first established with the UN to the Lucius Trust and the Lucius Publishing Company, and then start digging for their documents. And then some interesting books written about the UN and the European Union and NATO and all these things. There's actually one that covers the whole Luciferian circle, I think that was written in 2019, about the UN. When I find out the title, I'll give it to you. Interesting reading. Don't think Satan is not busy and active running things across this world. Every head is bowed.
every eye is closed. Father, bless this message. Take it out to a lost and dying world. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.